You've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show is founder of Aspire Fund and Opportunity Zone expert, Ryan Scott. Now, Ryan's a serial entrepreneur and a real estate investor who is in his early career as a consultant for Accenture and IBM, developed strong affinities for overlapping importance of shrewd investing and disruptive technology that he parlayed into his successful rental management group. Now, Aspire Fund is well aligned with his past experience as a real estate investor and as a business consultant consultant. So guys, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ryan Scott to the show. Ryan, how you doing, my friend? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Kim. Yeah, thanks for joining us here. And uh, just to give our, our listeners a sense of geography, uh, where are we talking to you at today? Where are you based out of? Uh, I live in, in Gilbert, Arizona, about 15 minutes outside Scottsdale. Okay. Okay. Good deal. And uh, I, I gave a very brief high-level overview. I know there's a lot more to it than that. So maybe take a few minutes, Ryan, if you would, and fill in the voids and the cracks as to your background and, and ultimately how you found your way into the real estate world. Yeah, no worries. Um, so just pretty quick, I you know got into consulting, IT consulting out of school. Um, things were okay, but you know, to be honest, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad while I was on a, a, a business trip and, and got hooked. I, I know I'm not the only one who got into that, right? And so really started to learn, kind of self-educate, join some, some groups, probably like yourself, that were helping do single family rentals, kind of turnkey, will help you rehab and then manage it, a good way to get started. And mm -hmm. you know, got lucky that that was at a time right after the crash when um, you could do okay, even if you didn't know what you were doing. Um, <laughs> you know, continued to work and had a W-2 job, like a lot of folks that helped get loans. Um, slowly, you know, acquired some other properties. And then, you know, as 2011, let's say, hit, and I was traveling a lot for work, Airbnb became pretty popular, started to rent out my place while I was gone for the week and really got addicted to um, how easy it was. There was big margin and, and it was fun. And so actually just took all the properties that I had for the most part and sold them, the single family homes, and got into... Um, duplexes and triplexes by the beach in San Diego. Um, huh. A lot bigger properties than I should have had at that age, but it was really the only thing to buy in San Diego that could actually pencil out. They were more expensive, but they were by the beach. And so, you know, started renting them out through Airbnb, used a property manager. Um, and the property managers at the time were old school, right? They, yeah. they used VRBO, they had actual keys, they were calling people on the phones. And that's just not how you know, the younger generation wanted to stay. And so I was able to rent them out more myself through Airbnb um, and, and figured, why do I need somebody else to take 25%? So I started Surfcomer Vacation Rentals, managing my own property, um, got a couple more properties there, and then started managing for other folks as well. Uh, still on the side, but you know, we used a lot of virtual assistance overseas, a lot of technology, and um, grew the business a bit in, in San Diego and um, did that for, for three, uh, probably five years. And then, you know, just real briefly in about 2018, moved to Gilbert, Arizona, got married and sold the business there as it got quite saturated um, with Airbnb. As a lot of folks probably know, there's just not as high margins anymore and rolled that money through an exchange into some properties here. But then really started looking at what do I do with this, this taxable gain, right? It's a good problem to have. But, you know, the traditional 1031 exchange meant we need to just buy more single family homes. And that's when I got into the Opportunity Zone concept and, and rolled the money into Aspire Fund as, as a new Opportunity Zone fund. Okay, good deal. Well, uh... Um, yeah, San Diego, very interesting that, that you started in San Diego buying those properties. I mean, 2011, I guess, uh, in probably most parts of the country, you could probably still ultimately find 
uh, things that penciled out. You know, California got hit pretty hard, as did uh, you know Arizona and many other parts of the uh, the country um, during the 2008 financial crisis. And uh, but I, I'm assuming today uh, those duplexes are probably worth uh, three times the amount that you paid for yeah. them back in 2011. It surely wouldn't pencil out for that type of uh, business model, <laughs> right? And it, for your listeners, no, I'm sure you guys talk about right. Even if they were continuing to make money, right? They were a million bucks at the time. They were making enough money to to justify costing a million, huge loan, um, but they were making money. But I didn't have very much money into them, yeah. right? And just as you said, then they go up and they're one and a quarter, one and a half million. Even though they're continuing to make money every month, when you think about the equity that's in there, as an outsider, yeah. you wouldn't buy that property anymore, right? And yeah. so at that yeah, it's a, point- It's a poor return on equity at that point in time. Yeah, and it, that's not popular with the family who wants to go to the beach, right? And why would you ever sell something by the beach? And so that was difficult, honestly, emotionally, but it was a lot of equity to have sitting in there that was not working enough. It was working, but not enough and, and risky to have it all in one place. So, so, so we sold, I thought I was smart before selling before COVID, but you know, it's gone crazy since then. So who knew? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Who knew in hindsight, right? So talk to us about your business strategy today with Aspire Fund. Yeah. So, so Aspire Fund is an opportunity zone fund, right? The, the crux of the opportunity zone, which we could talk about more if you want, is really if you have a capital gain, whether it's from a, a sale of a property or stocks or a sale of a business, you can roll that gain into a qualified fund and you don't have to pay the taxes until 2026. So that's, that's one of the main benefits. You defer those taxes, which gives you more money to invest in the fund. You do mm -hmm. still have to pay them when you get there, right? And the second benefit is if you stay in the fund for 10 years, when the fund sells, the gains that the fund has made are tax-free, right? Mm -hmm. So if you roll $100 in, by the end of the 10 years, it should be three or 400. You get to take back that entire 400,000 tax free. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, what I saw that got me into it was somebody posting it's a tax break of a generation. And that's that that really is what it is if you do it right. So that that was appealing also because I wanted to start my own fund anyway. So I had you know my own seed capital from the business, raised additional money from others and, and got started. Um, got it. And what, what is your business model with inside that Opportunity Zone fund? Sure. So, so inside the fund, our focus is kind of combining my experience with the vacation rental market, with experience up in the, the northern Arizona Flagstaff market and what they need. We've got some good, good team members up there. And we're focusing on um, uh, creating tiny home uh, communities that we rent short term. That's kind of the, the 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 primary focus. We've done one project so far where we subdivided some land. We've got tiny homes on the land that we're renting out short term on Airbnb. Very trendy space, a uh, lot of margin in there. Um, so piloted that on a smaller scale, and then we're looking to build a, a larger community, and that should be the first of of many that we're looking to roll out nationally. Um, there are some competitors out there doing similar things like Getaway, um, doing a great job, but we think there's you know, a lot of, of opportunity for others to play in the space. Okay, good deal. And um, the I guess let's talk about the demographic that you're going to be serving. As uh, you and I chatted about before we started recording here, was it when, when I think of, and we're in the manufactured housing space, right? So like we're in a very, very similar space to that yeah. of, uh, I guess, what most would classify as tiny homes, right? Because they're, they're mobile homes, uh, typically um, classified as an RV, not as a, not as a mobile home. They don't have a HUD stamp on or what have you. Um, but, uh, you know, when I think of tiny homes, which we do not have any in any of our communities. And so we, 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 we have a few smaller mobile homes, but they're not, they're not what <laughs> us would, yeah. you know, the, the, you know, you and I on this phone will classify as a tiny home. Um, I think of tiny homes as either catering to the, uh, you know, a more, uh, hipster demographic, you know, that, that, that younger clientele that wants to live in a communal type setting with other folks of similar age. Uh, or I think of empty, you know, empty nesters, folks that are, you know, downgrading their kids went away to school. They don't need to, 
2,500 square foot house anymore. Uh, they want to change of scenery and they want to really get more towards that minimal lifestyle. They want to sell the junk in their garage and uh, down, downgrade to one car versus two and, you know, live a slightly different lifestyle than that of what they did the past 40 or 50 years. And so, but I know there's other, you know, other demographics also that, that this niche will serve or could serve. And so maybe speak to that a little bit and then sure. we'll go into some detail as to, your particular strategy and, and who you look to, you know, gear it towards. Yeah. And so there, there's a couple different kind of end, end users and, and operations to a park like that, right? There's, there's short-term rentals, which is kind of the Airbnb model. And, and in the Airbnb model, I think the, the interest is really vast, right? Everybody who comes on to Airbnb wants the cool, trendy type home, right? On Airbnb, they call them unique stays. So I think there's a wide swath of folks, couples of any age that want to go that want not just to stay in a home, but to stay somewhere cool, right? Instagram. Yep. So to your point, young and hipster, <laughs> but certainly anyone who's, you know, Instagram and Snapchatting, I think it really does um, appeal, then um, you've also got now this big work life, remote work life uh, mindset, people taking a gap year, people working on um, just working remotely, right? And if you're working remotely, you could do that at a, at a very low cost without giving up the amenities, being out in, in the rural nature. And that's, you know, those two niches are really what we're looking at, right? We can talk about, you know, long-term folks and people that want to stay for a while, but we think there's a lot of demand for people who want a bit upscale, trendy kind of work-life, high-speed internet with amenities and a community feel. Um, and that's really the target. Okay. There's also the opportunity for, you know, just simply people who want to rent long term, don't want to be in a crowded urban building, want to be out with nature, want to be part of a community, as you mentioned. Um, and then the crowd, I think that that would be be very big on a lot of the mobile home parks like you mentioned. Right. But but maybe wanting to move past the traditional mobile home, but wanting to downsize, maybe pay lot rent, own the home, same model, but they're looking for um, maybe the the next iteration, right? Mobile mobile home 2.0. We don't call them that. Yeah. But, but that's the idea. <laughs> What's the typical price point of uh, one of these tiny homes? At least the, I guess, the uh, the quality that you're looking to put into your your communities here? Because I know there's probably just like in mobile homes and, and regular stick foot houses, there's such a range, right? Like there's budget and then there's like over the top. And so Absolutely. where are you guys heading? And then what's that look like from a price per square foot for these units? Yeah. So we the one we we've, we've done today are it's a local builder out of um Scottsdale uncharted tiny homes really like the operation there uh, very hands on custom built they they range from about i think 55 to 75 base and then you know depending on what you're looking for probably another 10 or 15k in, in upgrade so we we averaged out at about 85k that's delivered um and then you know put on site it's not the same kind of set that you guys often deal yeah. with but but put on site and, and then uh not permanently affixed but semi-permanent um and these have um you know um uh, tile showers um they're outfitted for for wi-fi the the bed is embedded in there um you know they look they look great right i mean my wife's kind of picky and she was, she was stoked to stay. So, um, and they, and they photograph well, they're about you know, the question is always, how big are they? I think we have a, we have four different models on our current, our current project. The smallest one I think is about 200. It's this, it's a, like a very small studio kind of fit in between two trees. And then they go up to, I think maybe 350 with a one bedroom and a, a loft, but on mm -hmm. average around, 250 square feet and you could put someone in, in the, the bedroom, so to speak. And then there's usually either a pullout or a loft. So you could, you could fit four and be okay. I think the regulatory uh, restriction, or at least the, the, you know, the kind of the breaking point is 400 square feet. That's when HUD steps in and, uh, and, and, and overcast, you know, the, the building standards and things of that nature. And so I think in order for it to be classified as a tiny home, or I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, they're, they're technically classified as RVs. Um, 
It yeah, does. I think they point. have to be 399 square feet or less, I think is, is what the classification is. And uh, please, uh, if, I'm, if I'm incorrect with that, guys that are listening, please, you can email me and let me know. But I'm pretty sure that's what it is. <laughs> like, likewise, right? I'm happy to be, be educated as well. That's been a part yeah. of the learning in the space is what does it mean, right? Because people use the term and a term could mean anything, right? A small park model, you could mark it as tiny homes in your in your um in your park. But what we're talking about and what we've done here is the tiny homes on wheels. That's what the yep. county likes to call them where, where we are. And so, yes, they're RVIA certified. Um, they come with the official s- sticker, which is an important piece, right? That basically says this has been uh, certified by RVIA. It's factory built. And when they come to the site, the county and the building division are only worried about the hookups, just like an RV, rather than yeah. how was it built inside. And that, you know, if people want to talk about happy to, to share offline, that nuance is important because if you're trying to go to HUD or you have someone who's not going to be able to get it RVIA certified, some guy creating in their backyard, you're going to need to go through building code whether it's HUD or something Mm -hmm. else, the building division is going to want you to use it. And so that's a key point is, is what's the certification? And, you know, you probably not want the county to have to be going through it. You just want to have that sticker, right? That says you're good. Right. And then what type of, uh, what type of debt or financing is available for the end consumer? So for these folks, you'll be building these communities, you'll be selling these, you know, these tiny homes for those that aren't cash buyers, right? Like that in a perfect world, you'd get cash buyers. Sure. Um, And a not so perfect, world. Some folks still have to get loans in order to afford you know, this type of housing or any type of housing. And so what type of debt is available nowadays? So I will say, so in, in our parts, we have a hybrid where we're going to own, I guess you, you would call them park own, a, a lot of them because we own them and we rent them out short. Okay, term. got it. We will provide the opportunity and I think we'll get enough interest that we're going to be attracted to selling them through to the end customer as has been the traditional model in the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the financing, there are a variety of players out there, not enough uh, I don't think, I think there's an opportunity for somebody to come in and, and make a lot of money there, but it's roughly 20% and you know, it's seven or 8% interest. It's like a, kind of like a personal loan, honestly, and more like an RV, RV loan. And they have five, seven, I think all the way up to 15 year turn. So that mm-hmm. piece is really nice for the end customer. It didn't exist at all before. On the commercial side, that's where things are... N- not as simple, right? Is to get, you know, commercial money if you're a park owner for, you know, 20 tiny homes. And that's, I think, probably where a group like yours comes in or other creative uh, lenders come in to to understand this model, which is a little bit different than a traditional mobile home park where it's permanently affixed. Yeah, but it's very similar to that of an RV park. And, there, and there's plenty of lenders out there that will ultimately finance RV parks. Maybe not, uh, you know, they're not exactly the same as lenders that, that, that really like to play in the mobile home park space. For example, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they love mobile home parks, but they don't offer any type of debt for RV communities, but there's plenty of other lenders that do. And so I, I'm guessing, I guess we can, the next question I would have is the underlying zoning. As you move to build these projects, I know you've got like kind of a, you know, your test study there in Flagstaff. Is the underlying zoning zoned for RV parks or RVs? Is that, or what is it? So just to go back to your last point, absolutely, people are willing to finance the construction and the build. But we, if you think about us, it's like we're owning all the RVs also. Oh, I got you. And okay, so right. So like the infrastructure the and all that, like that, that there's definitely sure. uh, debt readily available. But you're talking about the actual you know, infrastructure. And then you've got the actual units themselves on top of it. Understood. Right. So there's space for people. There's enough return, right? We're just having those discussions, right, to bring in the right partner in that respect. Um, but so the underlying zoning, yes. Yeah. So at least where 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 we are for the first couple, the zoning that's conducive is yeah c- considered manufactured home park zoning, and that zoning allows either the RVs or the manufactured homes. And because we qualify. Um, that's what we would use, right? That's one of our, you know, that's a great opportunity that there's already zoning that works, but also our challenge. People think it's a manufactured home park, even though it isn't. So we're going through rezoning now on on our uh, larger project and the county is uh, excited about the project and, you know, the neighbors have been excited too. So we'll see how it goes with, uh, mm-hmm. with the Board of Supervisors. Yeah, I guess I'm guessing that, uh, you know, the the NIMBY syndrome, which is fairly common in the mobile home park space, right? The not in my backyard, mm-hmm. uh, you know, getting a new 
community build a mobile home park community. It's got that negative stigma, that stereotype attached to it. And so that's a massive barrier challenge. However, RV parks are looked at very differently and tiny home uh, communities probably even differently than that, right? And that uh, they are not attracting the same type of clientele, although you could be, but like mobile home parks, again, that negative stigma is incredibly false. Like it's, it's outdated. Sure. It, it's, I mean, there's still poorly run communities today, but there's also equal amounts or, or, or even more that are run pro- properly and have great, great tenants and great residents yeah. that live in the community that are just like you and I, right? Um, in any event, uh, um, so you don't have that issue. You don't have that, that pushback from the local residents. What, what are some of the other big challenges with scaling this model? I guess uh, uh, more specifically, like when we move into a new market um, you know, that we do not have experience with, but we're buying existing products. So it's a little different, right? So there's already, there's already some uh, historical data associated with the community. And so we can base some of our decision to buy on that. We can also, you know, uh, put some test ads out there. We can look at other communities in the area and see what their occupancy is. And we can determine whether or not we feel there's a true demand for our product. Mm -hmm. However, being that you're in a, you're in a space that is uh, fairly new. I mean, you can't just go find thousands of tiny home communities across the country at some point that probably will be that way, but say that's not the case. How do you determine what the demand is and if the demand is sufficient in a new market that you're looking to scale into? Yeah, excellent question, right? So, so we have kind of three, we have the optionality of three potential end customers, three ways to operate the park during an exit, right? One is purely just think about it as a hospitality play. This is a big, cool, trendy hotel with the units separately placed around the grounds, right? And so we're looking um, at that as one. The other is just, these are affordable long-term rental housing, right? And how would you figure out if it made sense to have affordable housing in a community? And the other is, right, selling through to the end customer and they would own it. And that gets to housing demand at the you know lower end of the price point. So the, the last two are kind of more traditional analysis, right? If you take Flagstaff, there's a crazy housing shortage, not unlike elsewhere, but even not just you know, with what's going on in the market now, there just simply isn't enough affordable housing. And if there is affordable housing, it's not somewhere that people are as proud to live. So if we, if we look at housing needs, you know, sub 150K and that's strong, that that's a good, good indication, right? Long-term rentals, can we make rentals in the 1200 to 1500 a month and what's the demand and the supply there more traditional analysis on the short term and this is where really my background comes in right so there's a lot of um, newer analytics around the Airbnb and VRBO space right so air DNA is a great company that I've used for a long time that does analytics against um, existing rentals demand for rentals the kinds of places people are, um, searching for what are the rates they're looking for, and so you know that's one of the things that a lot of my investors had demanded is kind of why do you think this is the right place for that? And when we drill into what people are searching for, um, the price points, the occupancy, you know, you can analyze from there whether it makes sense or not, right? Some very cool stuff that that company hmm. does. Air DNA, good deal. I'll put that in the show notes, guys, for sure. I, I never heard of that. You know. As far as Airbnb is concerned, you know, we're speaking to like, that's more of a hospitality play. And I know that, um, you know, you had mentioned uh, the the management company back when you bought those duplexes or triplexes down in San Diego near the beach, you know, back then there weren't really any management companies that, that had uh, the expertise uh, of this short-term Airbnb model. Uh, There's plenty nowadays, you know, across the country. However, um, is that is the intent to actually outsource to a third party management company when you go into these different markets? Um, and if not, if if you don't intend to outsource it, how 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 large do these communities need to be in order to actually gain the economies of scale that's necessary to justify having kind of your own staff that are going to do the turnovers and the upkeep and maintenance, what have you? Yeah, good question. So, so we are likely going to outsource to a, a firm that I use for my own rentals in in the Flagstaff community, right? This is the the kind of the, the the second one where we really iron out the processes, the brand, and exactly how it's going to work, right? I think um, 
as we get larger and have a, a common consistent brand, um, we, we will potentially bring that in house across the different sites. Um, the size we're, yeah. So some of the questions are what, what do you need for the management in order to make it work? And that dro- that drives that. So we're looking to have a, a community feel where people aren't just checking in and then they see no one else the rest of the time they're there. That means that you want somebody on site who takes pride in running that park is part of, you know, posting to their social media is making sure everybody has what they need. And there's a, a community sense of feel, right? So you've got to have somebody who lives on site there's likely some staff. And so that, that necessitates a certain size. Um, we're looking at, at minimum t- 20 units for our first one, but all the way up to, to probably 60 or 70 as we mm-hmm. go. Um, you know, there's the, the, the question of saturation. And so we're just taking um, s- slower steps as we get there, but, but we're starting with at least 20 uh, on the first one. So on the larger ones, on like the, again, assuming that's out of Flagstaff, because Flagstaff is your backyard, right? And so you've got a lot of resources there, but I'm you know, assuming um, you're going to move towards scaling this model in different markets. And maybe it's just in Arizona, maybe it's just in, you know, areas in and around Flagstaff where you can still uh, utilize and leverage the existing resources that you have. Um, but it sounds like you want to kind of take this thing nationwide or at least, uh, you know, on a regional scale. Well, at that point in time, will it be to outsource the third party management or will, you know, if you had a community that was 60 or 70 units in size, would that, would that have the economies of scale and the, in the revenue necessary to have not just that onsite person, but to also have, I guess you could call it, I guess, housekeeping uh, and probably, mm-hmm. A, a, a maintenance individual, not necessarily probably maintenance staff, but probably one maintenance yeah. individual that could oversee repairs and maintenance. And then, you know, a housekeeping person or, or two that would ultimately handle the turns and cleanings um, between stays. Sure. Sure. And they, but they would, they would operate under the same kind of p- policies and procedures that we had across the different parks. But yes, I think each one would okay. need to have its own, its own onsite folks. And, you know, it's, it's in a way like a hotel, right? So there's some competitors out there. Let's just be honest, right? So getaway um, is a great one. And I think, you know, they've strived to have a similar experience if you go to different ones of their parks in different locations. And so, um, that's really the idea, um, that will be same, you know, look and feel and experience, but you've got to have an individual who makes that the case. And, and my view is, especially nowadays with people being able to work remote, wanting to get out of town, this is an absolute dream job for, uh, you know, someone, maybe a couple, maybe one person is, is great with, with marketing and another is great with a hammer. They want to get out of town. They could be the point person for that park, right? Live there, get to live their dream, take care of it, build it into what it's on, right? So as we move forward, we're really going to put out a search for, you know, c- come run a community, build it, get some equity, build a business um, and get to live, you know, really your dream. And so rather than a traditional model where it's a big national firm, I think that angle is, is more where we want to go. They'll be proud to post their own, you know, Instagrams and whatnot and, and have a sense of pride. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Uh, Ryan, what else would you like to share that maybe we haven't covered today as it relates to uh, Opportunity Zones, Aspire Fund, or, you know, just generally speaking, the tiny home business model? Yeah, so so happy to 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 talk with anyone outside of this, you could tell it's something I, I actually really enjoy. I got plenty of people in my life that I talk to about it that don't want to hear about it. So, you know, happy if people are looking to start their own, even in their own backyard um, or, or thinking about, for example, sh- I have some capital gains. Should I put it into an existing fund like ours, right? We're happy to take money or should I even consider making my own fund? I think you know, it's maybe a topic for another show, but, but there's, it's, it's possible to start your own rather than some other complex programs where the overhead is, is too burdensome. Right. So Mm -hmm. questions about where to, to contribute, you know, the, the other path we didn't talk about today, which I'm happy to chat with folks is, is really the shipping container home space. And that's another angle of, you know, innovative, affordable housing, kind of like tiny homes Mm -hmm. that we're branching into and not just parks, but multifamily, some cool, cool stuff there. I wonder how that is with, uh, with with different zoning departments across the yeah. country and, and getting them, uh, you got it, because now comes the education phase, you know, for those yes. that aren't familiar with that type of uh, building method. And uh, I'm guessing that's probably one of the bigger barriers to entry 
in using storage can, or shipping containers as, um, as residences. There was actually a cool project that came across my desk. Um, um, it was in California. I can't remember yep. the city that was in. Are you familiar with this one? It was a old- yeah. I think it's Crate Crate Modular, and they have some down in LA. They've got a couple different ones. I'm curious which one you saw. Yeah, and I, I don't recall the market. It's actually for sale right now. It's it's actually on the market for sale. But oh, it was cool. it was an old mobile home park, and they uh, they got it. It was an old dilapidated mobile home park, and they basically uh, did a multi tier. Uh, they were able to keep the same zoning in place. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm assuming that's a you know, city by city, municipality by municipality of like, they, they got approval to keep that zoning in place, but they ultimately built these, um, I think they're two story, uh, container structures. I think they on average, they're cool. like 650 or 700 square feet in total mm-hmm. living, living space. And, uh, basically created a container community that is on the same footprint of what an old dilapidated mobile home park was. And it's still classified, still zoned yep. as a mobile home community, but, um, and now it's trading at an all time. I mean, like literally, I forget the cap right now. I don't know what they have been to it, but it's trading at like a four and a half cap. And uh, I'm yeah. sure there was uh, some incredible value that they added to the, <laughs> the project, the original basis of the project. That is so. It's it's so true. It's a similar model to what we're doing with the tiny homes. And really, the the exam question answer is is how do you do that with the zoning? So there are companies that that create basically factory built shipping containers. And what I mean by that is they don't build the shipping container there, but they produce it into a home in the same way that modular homes are produced. Mm -hmm. Then they get that third party seal of approval, similar to RVIA, but it's factory built housing. And then places like even the county where I work, look at that as, okay, this is approved from a third party. Now I can consider it modular housing, just like the way they look at our tiny homes as, okay, this is RVIA. I can consider it RV, and then they don't care necessarily. And that's a huge opportunity. I'm sure that this, this group you talked with um, or that you saw, it's incredibly efficient, right? Mm-hmm. So to get such a great cap rate, have so much value, they probably didn't even need that much to make a killing. So yeah, um, yeah it's, it's a cool opportunity. Well, Ryan, it's been fun having you on the show. Uh, wishing you all the best with this, uh, you know, this business model and your in your strategy here, and uh, look forward to following your progress. But again, appreciate you coming on and sharing insights with us about uh, this uh, this world that a lot of folks know little about. So it's been a lot of fun. All good. Yeah. Thanks for the time, Kevin. Congratulations! Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com and we'll see you next Monday morning.